Thank you. So this morning we have a, a guest speaker, uh, Pastor John Oaks from Ebenezer. Ebenezer is our great grand uh, mother church. Uh, so it was the first NAB church established here in Vancouver. Then after that came Bethany, Emmanuel, and Pilgrim. So um, Pastor John's been there, I think, about a year now. I'd like to invite you up, uh, Pastor John, and uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, today is, a, is what they call a pulpit exchange. That's why we don't have a pulpit. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we actually don't have a pulpit much anymore anyway, but it's actually a pastor exchange. So it's a different pastor in the pulpit. So uh, Pastor Shell is over at uh, Ebenezer this morning, and Pastor John is here with us. So um, we'll let you uh, share what you have uh, on your heart for us this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, let me first bring you greetings from, I was going to say, uh, your sister church of uh, Ebenezer Baptist up on the corner of Fraser and uh, 52nd. Um, when Shell first put forward this idea of a swap, uh, we both thought it was a good idea. We hope that by the end of this morning, um, you will too. Uh, if you have a Bible, uh, or if you're going to use the Pew Bible, I think in my pew it was on page 779, I'd invite you to turn to Acts chapter 11, uh, beginning at verse 1. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem... The circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of circumcised people and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto God life. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's bow our heads. Loving God, we thank you that you have not chosen to leave us alone and in the dark about who you are, how we can follow you, how we can come to faith, and how we should lead our lives. But you have given us your word. As we uh, study it now, and especially this passage from Acts chapter 11, we pray that you would draw very near by your Holy Spirit, that you would illumine our minds and hearts, that you would give us a fresh sense of your love and your truth 
and what it means for us today that we are called to follow Jesus, in whose precious name we pray. Amen. I have to confess that I haven't always been a great fan of old movies, at least not so many made before the 1970s. But as the years have progressed, I've come to appreciate a growing number of exceptions like Citizen Kane or Sunset Boulevard and a film that has always stayed in my memory is Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Some of you may have seen it. Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn play a classic pair of liberal parents who pride themselves on being models of of generosity and tolerance, but their world is turned upside down when their daughter invites her new fiancé to dinner, and he turns out to be black. Actor Sidney Poitier does an amazing job of highlighting the hidden prejudices and insecurities that lie beneath this family's facade as he charms his way through the movie. The result is really a comedy, but it's one that asks a lot of serious questions. In particular, how tolerant are we of people who are different from us, even when we perhaps like to consider ourselves open-minded? And we face these kinds of issues all the time, of course, in the church. Here, more than anywhere, we're supposed to be truly welcoming of all comers. We're taught in the words of, of John chapter 13 to love others just as the Lord has loved us. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, Jesus says in verse 35 of John 13, if you love one another, if you love one another. But do we really? That's the question that challenges the Apostle Peter in our reading from Acts 11 after he receives what I'm going to call a radical revelation with truly revolutionary results. That's a radical revelation with revolutionary results. And how so? Let's turn to our text and find out. Beginning with Peter's amazing revelation and how it came about. Now, I guess that we've all been in situations where we've had to face objections and complaints from others. After more than 25 years in pastoral ministry, I would personally suggest that the ability to cope well with them should be listed as a key qualification by any search committee. To give you just one example from my own experience, I can still vividly recall my first Sunday at one church where one of its senior members greeted me at the door after the main morning service with a smile and told me that I was only there for the money. Rather a strange comment to make to a pastor. And I wasn't half as clever as I thought I was. My reply on that occasion was simply to thank this lady for her feedback. What else could I do? But not all complaints demand a diplomatic response, especially in a situation like that faced by the Apostle Peter in Acts 11, where other believers are strongly criticizing his ministry for making changes, major changes, in church practice. Now, of course, change is never easy. It can be be difficult at the best of times. I'm reminded of the old story of a centenarian celebrating his 100th birthday, who was asked by a reporter whether he had seen a lot of changes. Yes, he said proudly, and I've opposed every single one of them. And churches can struggle with new ideas, as someone once said when, no doubt exasperated by a particularly stubborn group, some are born again and some are born against. So we can begin to imagine, perhaps, 
the kind of opposition that Peter must have faced in Jerusalem when he visits in verse 2. And why so? Because the apostle hasn't just been fiddling around the edges of church life, as it were, making minor modifications here and there. He's been introducing really major changes right into the heart of traditional practice. He's especially criticized in verses 2 and 3 by Jewish Christians who've heard about his ministry among non-Jews or Gentiles. So they charge him with visiting them and enjoying table fellowship with them. Now, of course, at this stage, the apostolic church is still very young, and it's a little misleading then to talk of major traditions. But one thing is clear. While Jesus may personally have attracted followers from many different backgrounds, the early church at this point is primarily made up of Jewish believers who are still honoring Hebrew customs, including that of not sharing a meal with Gentiles. So when Gentiles start coming to faith, as they do right from the day of Pentecost, when the in that amazing scene when the the Holy Spirit comes on the church in fullness and power in Acts 2, that raises serious questions. And when Peter has a dramatic encounter with the Roman centurion Cornelius and his family, the issues of table fellowship and indeed of Gentile conversion as a whole are brought right to a head. Now, I'm not going to rehearse every single detail of this remarkable story this morning, but to state just the main facts. Cornelius is clearly a religious man, but he's not a Christian. He lives in the northern coastal town of Caesarea, about 125 kilometers from Jerusalem by modern roads. He's praying one afternoon when he receives a vision from God in which an angel tells him to send for the apostle Peter, who's staying in a place called Joppa, another city, about 60 kilometers to the south. Not surprisingly, Cornelius does what he's told. I suspect that most of us would if we ever got a message like that, although we might be a little surprised that we got it at all. But before his messengers even arrive in Joppa, Peter gets a radical revelation of his own. According to his account, of events in verse 4 following of our passage, he's in prayer. He's in prayer when he sees a vision in a trance. And what's it all about? Well, at first it may read like something out of an adventure or or even a horror movie. Jurassic Park meets Alien, perhaps. (laughs) But it's much more serious than that. He sees something like a large sheet descend from the sky and on it, There's a kind of cornucopia, a glorious mixture of forbidden animal foodstuffs, at least from an Old Testament point of view, all apparently still alive and kicking. Now, I don't want to offend any vegetarians that may be with us more than necessary this morning. I don't eat meat myself. But there are, we're told, four-footed animals of the earth, according to verse 6, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. And what does the apostle hear a voice tell him? The words are are very clear in verse 7. Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now, I'm not ashamed to say, as still a somewhat proud Englishman, although I've been in North America for going on 30 years now, that I'm no great expert when it comes to some traditionally male activities here, like construction or car maintenance or things like that. You might even call me practically challenged. (laughs) And I don't mind admitting as much. And two other pursuits that have never been a big hit with me are hunting and fishing. I've not been hunting at all, and I can only remember two occasions 
as a child when I tried fishing. The major problem both times was that I didn't really want to catch anything because I was afraid to pull the fish off the hook. And I can still remember sitting hours by a pond in Surrey, England, before a kind soul took pity on me and told me that I was very unlikely to catch anything at all with the big old sea fishing rod that I had at this freshwater pond. So I know for a certainty that if I had received the instruction to kill and eat in Peter's vision, I wouldn't have been too enthusiastic about it. But for the apostle Peter, the issue goes beyond mere squeamishness or even dietary preferences. He's no uptight Brit, and he's no militant vegetarian. He's a devout Jewish Christian who has been deeply steeped in Old Testament prohibitions against eating certain kinds of foods, as listed in Leviticus chapter 11. For him, the animals in the sheet are unclean. They're absolutely forbidden food for him, and that's what he says in verse 8. Surely not, Lord, the apostle protests. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. Surely not, Lord. That's a strong response to divine revelation. But the Lord persists and persuades, as he so often does, do not call anything impure that God has made clean, the voice says, and the whole vision is repeated twice over for emphasis. I guess Peter really needed to get the point then what Peter learns by revelation is confirmed for him by experience, and that couldn't be much more dramatic if you think about it. Cornelius' three messengers arrive at his door. They ask Peter to go with them to Caesarea, which he does. Then after Cornelius has told the apostle about his own vision, which we read in verse 15, that Peter begins to speak. So there he is, after a 60-kilometer journey in a Roman centurion's house, sharing the gospel with a group of Gentiles, and what happens? We can read about the outcome in some detail in Acts 10 and 11. To put it bluntly, exactly the same thing occurs as on other occasions in Peter's ministry. The Holy Spirit descends on those present and they begin to speak in other tongues and praise God. They obviously come to a living faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So Acts 10 verse 48 tells us that the apostle orders them to be baptized. All in all then, this is an amazing and dramatic story. Two visions given quite independently to two different people, bring them together, and as a result, a whole household comes to faith. The Apostle Peter's radical revelation leads him not only to travel miles to minister to a family that he's never met before, but to change long-held beliefs in the process. And as we begin to think about what this passage of Scripture may mean for us today, it's that second point. What I've called the revolutionary results of all this on which I want to focus. Surprises aren't always welcome, are they? There's an old story about a woman who posted her Christmas wishes on the refrigerator for her husband to read. But rather than listing particular items, she simply requested something that will make me look beautiful. When Christmas finally rolled around, she no doubt expected to open a package of new clothes, perhaps, or something similar. But what she really found surprised her because it was an exercise bike. (laughs) The Houston Post once told another tale about a young man from a a wealthy family who was about to graduate from high school. It was customary in his affluent neighborhood for parents to give students a car as a graduation gift, and that's what the guy expected. 
He spent months talking about cars and looking at them with his father. And just a week before graduation, they found what appeared to be the perfect vehicle. The young man was certain that he would one day see that car in his driveway. But when he opened his father's gift, he was disappointed, even though it actually turned out to be a new Bible. The guy was so mad, in fact, that he threw it down and stormed out of the house. And he never reconciled with his father until he died. But as the son went through his dad's belongings after the funeral, he was in for a big surprise. He came across the Bible that his father had given him years before. He brushed off the dust and opened it. And to his shock and horror, he found a cashier's check hidden between the pages. It was dated the day of his graduation and was for the exact amount of the car that he and his father had chosen together. This may be a rather corny story, perhaps. A lot of my illustrations are. But it reminds us of an important truth for our Heavenly Father is very much a God of surprises, good surprises, great surprises. And many of them are to be found in the pages of Scripture if only we will dig deeply enough. And as we turn to consider the truly revolutionary results of God's revelations to Peter in Acts 10 and 11, God's word repeatedly plays an important part. Not only in direct communication through visions, but in the apostles' memory. For it's as Peter sees the work of the Holy Spirit among Cornelius' household that he remembers the words of Jesus, which are first reported in Acts 1. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's what ultimately convinces him, according to verses 16 through 18, that Gentiles, too, are becoming Christians. So they're to be welcomed into the church because he's seen them come to faith. He's seen them be filled with the Holy Spirit with his own eyes. And we should be very careful lest we underestimate the dramatic importance of this development. For what we're ultimately reading about in Acts 10 and 11 is a revolutionary redefinition of church membership and its qualifications. No longer is the church to be reserved for Jewish converts. All can now be included. As the church leaders in Jerusalem conclude in verse 18, where after Peter finally convinces them of the rightness of his actions, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. So there are no second-class citizens in God's kingdom. There are to be free admission and a warm welcome for all who come to saving faith in Christ and all who are seeking Christ. Old Testament dietary prohibitions no longer apply, nor do outdated regulations about not sharing food with the uncircumcised. Instead, all are to be invited to fellowship. All who know Jesus are to be received as they are, just as they've been blessed by the wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit. These are the revolutionary results of what happens in Acts 10 and Acts 11, and they continue to impact us today, I think. So as we begin to draw to a close, I want to offer a few last thoughts about how this may still challenge us personally. Whatever the problems of the past, and I don't want to get into those this morning, I know of no church in Canada today that systematically excludes or abuses people because of their ethnic or racial background. We have other criteria, of course, 
And Baptists tend to be somewhat stricter about membership requirements, for example, than many others. But even if some of us are better at it than others, we all recognize the need to be open and welcoming to newcomers because we're striving to follow the teaching and example of Christ himself. Jesus calls all his followers to love each other as he loved us. And one of the most striking features of his life and ministry is how he made himself open, how he was prepared to reach out to all comers. He excluded no one for failing to meet established social, cultural, or even religious standards. And he actively sought out those whom society otherwise marginalized or neglected. So much so that he was judged. He was judged by contemporary religious leaders for spending too much time with those they dismissively labeled sinners. But I wonder how faithful we always are to his example. How welcoming are we towards those whose lifestyles we disapprove of, for example, or who are perhaps in reduced social circumstances, or who are particularly demanding of our time and attention? Are we as comfortable accommodating the single person on welfare as the more affluent one who may still be part of a nuclear family? Does the guy with a drinking or substance abuse or moral problem find a warm welcome? Does anyone who is totally new or unfamiliar to our community? These are challenging questions for every church, but our passage reminds us that we constantly need to ask them. As the Apostle Peter found to his surprise, the church is open to all whom God calls and all who come to Christ. Let me close, and I really will close this time, with another story from a much more recent movie. I've never actually seen it, and I rarely recommend films from the pulpit, but basically, My Big Fat Greek Wedding (laughs) is a comedy based on the real-life experiences of the Greek-American actress Nia Vardalos. Tula Portokalos, who's paid by Nia, is the daughter of a, of a restaurateur who owns the Dancing Zorba restaurant in Chicago. At 30 years of age, this, this single woman seems destined perhaps to be a hostess in her father's restaurant for the rest of her life. But Tula has dreams of, of getting a college degree, and she wants to fall in love. She meets Ian Miller, a long-haired English teacher, and they immediately hit it off. But as their relationship develops, Tula becomes increasingly concerned that because Ian isn't Greek, her parents won't approve of the relationship. She persists in persuading her family that she has found the man of her dreams. But even though they gradually consent to their daughter's choice, the family insists that Ian adopt their Greek culture and faith. I'm probably spoiling the plot here, I realize, for anyone who hasn't seen this movie, including me. When, (laughs) When Ian's parents, who are a wealthy couple without any extended family, accept a dinner invitation at Tula's parents' home, they're totally unprepared then for what they experience. As the Millers drive into the suburban neighborhood, they can't help but notice that the Porto Calos garage door has been painted into a huge Greek flag. I don't think they'd like it at Ebenezer if I put a Union Jack on the garage door. (laughs) Even more amazing to them is the fact that they're greeted on the front lawn by nearly 100 people. The entire Porto Calos clan As Tula's father, Gus, addresses the Millers above the boisterous crowd, he smiles broadly and says, Welcome to my home. Then Tula's mother approaches the bewildered couple and gives them a traditional hug and kiss 
on the cheek. Now the Millers clearly aren't used to this kind of warm, expressive welcome. But their deer in the headlights expression relaxes as they realize how much they're loved. And Gus and his extended family welcome them inside the home for an evening of Greek-style feasting and hospitality. So what could have been a rather forbidding, anxious experience for the Miller family turns into something much more positive, much more welcoming. And the shame could surely be true of everyone who approaches a Christian community in whatever setting. The great good news of the gospel, as Acts 11 makes clear, is that everyone, absolutely everyone who repents of their sins, who turns to Christ in faith and receives the life-giving gift of the Holy Spirit, becomes part of the family of faith. God offers an open invitation. God welcomes us all with open arms, wherever we are and just as we are into the family of God. And our high privilege and responsibility, those of us who already belong, is to extend that warm welcome, that open invitation, however and whenever we can, to others. Let's bow our heads. Loving God, we thank you for how your word can speak to us still today.